Welcome back. We just heard from New York State Republican Chairman Ed Cox as the state moves center stage in the GOP primary fight. But just because the non-frontrunners are eyeing the Empire State doesn't mean it'll be a game changer or does it? Let's pose that question and others to our panel tonight. Jeannie Zeno is here. She is a professor of political science at Iona College and of campaign management at NYU. Welcome back. Dominic Carter is here, political journalist and author. And Ellis Hennigan is here. He is our resident truth teller, a columnist for Newsday and a political analyst. So it's, it's great that the New York primary matters for the first time in no one seems to know when. But the question is, will it actually matter? And, Gina, the, the latest poll that we have for the state is from Emerson College, and it has Trump up 64 to 12. It's a 52-point lead for Donald Trump. Do we believe those numbers at this point? We expect the race will tighten up significantly from there? You know, I think I agree with you. It's so exciting for New Yorkers that April 19th may actually matter this yeah. time around. It looks like it's going to matter on the Democratic side, of course, and potentially on the Republican. But I think a lot of that depends on what happens April 5th when you look at what's going on in Wisconsin. Um, I think if there is are any surprises there or if it is tighter in Wisconsin than we think, then I think New York is going to matter a heck of a lot. I think if Trump takes Wisconsin in some kind of big way, I think it's going to matter a little bit less. And of course, he has the advantage of being Trump, having his name all over New York City and being so well known here. And you have, of course, his leading contender as somebody who has criticized the state. So, you know, you're starting out on an imbalanced playing field already. But Ellis, you, you might make the argument that the people who know Donald Trump best, New Yorkers, might be the least inclined to vote for him, but the polling doesn't seem to indicate That's, that. You know, that was exactly what I was going to say. Absolutely. Right. And I suspect if you did a general election poll on Trump, he would not be polling Jeannie anywhere near as well. Because, right, there's a little bit of, we've kind of seen his act for so long. And uh, But, you know, if you get down to the Republican base voter in New York, it's not that large a group, really. Is it the voter, Dominic, or is it the competition? I mean, are people just so cool on Ted Cruz and John Kasich that Trump shines by comparison? Great question. The answer is each one. First of all, the last place in the world that Ted Cruz can do well is here in New York. He, as we speak, he is in an ongoing battle, quote, with the mayor and his henchmen, referring to Police Commissioner mm -hmm. Bratton. So... Ted Cruz and his anti-New York message is not exactly his family values message <laughs> that he uses New York to make the case. That's not exactly going to uh, sell here. Trump, the, to answer your original question, the margin will close, but it will still be a blowout. Trump's going to win hands down. Dominic clearly has New York values. <laughs> I wait, wait. Spot him a mile away. Are you saying that as an insult or a compliment? That's, no, uh, that's, that's Cruz's <laughs> famous term, right? right? right, right Typical right. New York values. Right. Typical New York values. You know, right, we, right. we wind up with a, with a New York City area bias. We're all either in the city or close to the city, and so... You know, we're not necessarily the same voting bloc that we see in the rest of the state. But Ed Cox mentioned during the interview the blue collar workers uh, around the state that seem to play to Trump. The, the misread nationally among the anger of blue collar Republicans seems to be playing across New York as well, even if we don't necessarily see that in New York City, Jeannie. I think that's true. And, you know, it wasn't it Trump who said at one point he's more popular than God in upstate New York. And I think that that speaks a little bit to this idea that he is going to obviously be so well known in the city and, and do well here. But you go upstate and that's those that's the kind of constituency that he's been performing well with around the country. And so I think he's going to do very well upstate. And of course, he thinks he's going to do incredibly well upstate. I, I'm curious what you've all heard from from Republicans or, or you know, if you may be a Republican, uh, just where that anger is and what it's based in, because it it seems like there's been a misread from pundits. There seems like there's been a misread from even elected officials who haven't quite gotten wind of it. What is generating it? Is it is it the economy? Is it President Obama? Is it just a combination of all things? Is it frustration in Washington? Ellis, what's your sense? First of all, let me defend the religiosity of people in Syracuse and Buffalo. But I don't know if Donald and is... In Rochester. In Rochester. I don't know if Donald is number one. He said he is more popular than God in upstate New York. And I'm sticking with it. He also said he shoot people on Fifth Avenue. Yeah. But, but, right. Andrew, but Andrew, there is something at the core of there this is. that's real. And, and I think it's largely economic. I mean, we all know folks, particularly in their, in their 40s and 50s, and beyond, the economy has just passed by. I mean, their skills are no longer in demand. They're being replaced by younger and cheaper workers. They don't really have any confidence about their own futures. And Donald Trump answers those anxieties very, very clearly, as, by the way, does Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. but, but, yeah, the feeling is very real. People aren't making that up. 
Jeannie, do you also sense it's economically based or is, it, is there something else at play? I think it's usually economics number one, but I think there are other things. I think it's frustration with the direction of the country under President Obama, who people feel like, you know, in many ways has ushered in a society that they no longer recognize. You know, you look at the Supreme Court's decisions on gay marriage recently, for instance, and then you combine that with the sense that people have absolutely no trust in government or institutions, governmental and non-governmental. You combine that and you're looking at you know, an increasing number of, of people who feel frustrated. And as Ellis mentioned, it's on the left and the right. We see the same thing with Bernie Sanders. And they're speaking essentially to this real frustration that people feel. We'll shift to the Democrats in just a second. But Dom, let me put you on the shoulder of Dan Donovan on Staten Island or Lee Zeldin out in Suffolk County or any of the other Republicans who hold elected position uh, in the state. Do they fall in line behind Donald Trump just to go along to get along? And do you think that happens before the primary, after the primary? I believe if you're Dan Donovan, and he was just elected, what, how long ago? Recently. Like, yeah, late last year. Okay, so if you're Donovan or, or a New York Republican, I believe that you kind of try and keep Trump at arm's length. I don't see you campaigning with him uh, because I don't think many Republicans locally or nationally believe that Trump has actual coattails. I, I guess coattails in terms of how much damage, mm -hmm. and so I'm being a bit sarcastic. So you, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't look to start a war if you don't have to. You know, so you're, you're talking about if Trump wins the nomination? Well, currently, as I'm saying stands. right now, as we as we gear right up right now, the you just act like he doesn't exist. He, he's just not there. Yeah, I don't know, Don. One thing I notice about politicians who make endorsements is that it's far better, and they much prefer to endorse someone who's likely to win. Right. Right. Because when the yes. guy loses, he can't do anything for yes, you. That's true. And as long as he has a chance of winning, and right now, Donald is the leading Republican candidate. I, who else are they going to endorse? But really? but but they're not going to jump out there because if you if you throw your hat in the ring and endorse Trump, that means that every outrageous thing he says going you forward, own. you <laughs> own it and you're resp and yeah. guys like us are going to be standing there with the mic in in our hands saying Trump just said in Nebraska X Y Z. What do you think? Though it might be easier for a, an endorser to walk away from a comment from Donald Trump than, let's say, another candidate just because of the unique nature of Donald Trump's candidacy and the things that he says. Let me shift over to the Democrats. And, and Bernie Sanders is trying to make his last stand in New York. And, Gina, I want to start with the polls again. So the, the polls in New York show a 71-23 advantage for Hillary Clinton, at least the most recent poll. Is Bernie miscalculating here if he thinks this is the place to make his last stand? That's a pretty big lead. It's a big lead, but I think, as Dominic said in the Republican case, I think it is going to tighten. And again, I go back to Wisconsin. If Bernie Sanders can close the gap in Wisconsin or indeed, you know, repeat what he was able to do in Michigan. I mean, let's face it, he had three huge wins over the weekend, not delegate wise, but you look at those percentages. That is a lot of momentum going into Wisconsin April 5th. If he can do well there and carry that into New York and challenge her in her home state, even if he doesn't win, if he does better than expected, I think he's going to have a lot of momentum going out and certainly he's going to see this thing through California. It's an uphill battle, certainly, but I think Bernie Sanders has a lot more momentum to do better here than people expect. Well, let me play out that scenario that, that Bernie Sanders does better than people expect, but he doesn't win New York. Can, what's his end game here? What's he staying in the race for? Because at that point, the, the mathematical possibilities for becoming the nominee are almost nil. That's right. And don't forget, New York is one of Hillary's three home states. I mean, so there's some, there's some advantage there. Uh, I would look at it a slightly different way. It, it seems to me that the math makes it an almost foregone conclusion that Hillary Clinton is going to be the nominee. So the dance really isn't so much about a fight for delegates. It's figuring out from the Hillary point of view, how do you get Bernie gone without alienating the passionate supporters that you need in November. So she can't push him out, she can't urge him out, but she kind of would like him to leave. She has to handle That's it the very dance. delicately, and she That's has the over the last couple of weeks. She's refrained from criticizing him as, as sharply, but what's Sanders' endgame, Ellis? Well, he what's he was in stuff. Do you I really, mean, do you really, but do you think he believes he can be the nominee? Um, I don't know. Politicians delude themselves <laughs> at times like this. But he clearly has a message. He wants to pull the party in a more progressive direction. He owes something to all these people who are sending him thirty dollars. And you know what? I think he's been a great opponent. And, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, go I was going to say, and let's not forget the LA Times had this piece about the email controversy, the interviews that are starting. 
Bernie Sanders has now made it clear that he is the number two guy. Before it was That's talk true. if Hillary Clinton was, you know, indicted, and again, there's no evidence she would be, but she somehow was pushed out of the race, we'd bring in Biden or, or you know, Gore or somebody else. Bernie Sanders has now made the case that it is his, he is the, at least the second, if not the first, and I think he firmly believes he can win this thing, or at least, as Ellis mentioned, move the party about issues that he cares about. I don't think he, Bernie Sanders, I don't even think he believes he can win. But he can, by staying in the race, keep, sec keep Secretary Clinton honest and pull her to the left. And so she's trying to look almost at almost any event. She's trying to make that pivot mm -hmm. to go towards the general election. And Sanders is there going, uh-uh, uh-uh, <laughs> remember what you did in 2008? You stayed around, Madam Secretary, until the very end. So if you did that, I have the right to do it as well. He's going to keep her honest. Yeah. Has she done enough so far, Jeannie, to keep Bernie su supporters happy enough that they'll, that they'll probably vote for her or maybe vote for her or consider voting for her come November? I don't think she's not done enough yet, and I think it's still early, but I think she does have to move in that direction. Look, it's not as much of an uphill battle as it was for Obama to keep those Clinton supporters that he was losing in 2008. So she has, a, you know, a, somebody there to look to as an example, but she's going to have to work hard, and I think a lot of it's going to depend on how he is treated at the convention, how these issues impact the platform, and, you know, how she embraces them going forward. And she does need those supporters because it is going to be a game of turnout, and they have the energy on their side. And lots of Sanders supporters are angry voters also, in the, similar to Donald Trump's. So they're just angry at the system, angry at the economy right now. She doesn't come across as the angry candidate, and she certainly can't be the outsider in all of this. How does she win Sanders Democrats to keep them in her pocket for November? Issues. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's about style. I think it's about signing on to the $15 minimum wage or some openness to single-payer health care or, or those other practical issues that, that, that they care about. But, you know, in the end, you have to ask, though, where are they going to go? In, in the same That's way, the bottom line. In the same way that the Cruz and the Trump people somehow, now, they're not going to vote for Hillary but the, in the, the end. But the danger for her is they stay home. They yeah, don't go anywhere. True. And that, that's for true. her, is a big problem if they don't turn out. Or they consider voting for Trump. It's the anger at Washington, anger at the status quo. I mean, there, there is I, I that linkage that. between I, Trump I, I, and I, Sanders. I, I you hear that. anecdote of that, but I, I, don't, I don't know yeah. anybody who'd make that leap. I, well... I do know somebody who would make that, <laughs> not me, <laughs> but it's just one person. <laughs> Sorry. Wait, aren't you the social scientist? I thought anecdote was not science. It's professor. not. Professor. professor. An All right, so we have more Trump analysis right after this. We're going to ask if the media is at least partly to blame for the surge of Donald Trump. We're going to tell you what some members of the media have to say about that, and their answer might surprise you.